<laughs> All right, now we can see if we can get that first slide up, right? Oh, that was interesting, you covered it. 10 minutes ago, we couldn't find my talk, it wouldn't load, so we're, we're doing okay here. Uh, well, this is indeed a, a tremendous honor for me. Uh, first of all, Sandy and Jim, thanks for the introduction. Um, the, um, but I have to tell you, my first couple of slides, I think Sandy has pretty much, uh, I'll be recapitulating some of her comments about John. Uh, the one I do want to bring to your attention is that um, when I, somehow I don't have control here yet. There we go. Uh, when I applied to medical school, um, there were eight medical schools in Canada that I could apply to, and I decided to apply to uh, seven of them. And one of them was uh, McMaster University, where John, as many of you know, uh, enjoyed 17 years. Well, it turns out uh, he interviewed me for medical school. And uh, I got accepted to six of the seven medical schools that I applied to, so I'll let you decide uh, what I thought about John Sutton back then. Uh, that is a true story, by the way. Um, as uh, Sandy said, I'll just hit some of the highlights here. This really is, for me, truly uh, an honor, uh, certainly being past president of the college and, and being able to, to give this address. As many of you know, uh, Ben Levine gave the, the first Sutton lecture, and uh, I certainly am not here to try to uh, emulate uh, Ben. Uh, I was sitting with him this morning at the Dill Lecture, so imagine you've got uh, Barry Franklin giving the Dill Lecture, and you've got commentary from uh, Ben Levine. So it was a great way to kick off this morning, and, and I'll do my best here this afternoon. Maybe just to hit a couple highlights here, as you know, John was uh, originally from Australia, and he, he did spend 17 years in Canada where I did get to know him. Uh, I actually got to know him as an undergrad because many of you probably don't know this, but his original research was really focused on skeletal muscle. He developed a close relationship with colleagues of mine at the University of uh, Waterloo, such as Howie Green. And uh, as you know, though, probably his most important work uh, was related to uh, altitude. Uh, and certainly the 1986 study where they used the decompression chamber to simulate the climbs of Mount Everest, I think, is what we probably recognize John most for. Uh, he did go back to the University of Sydney in 1989 and earned a doctorate of science in 1995. Uh, very impressive, as you know, in terms of his uh, academic credentials. But beyond publishing and so on, as Sandy said, he really was a pioneer. And, and some of my, my final comments will talk about change, which is really what this lecture is about today, kind of thinking out of the box. Here's a couple of the highlights of, of conferences that John uh, organized. Uh, I was actually was able to speak at the one at uh, University of Western Ontario in 1988. Uh, he's the past president of ACSM as well as CASM, so he's the only person to have ever held that appropriately. Uh, as I think Fran O'Connor, Bill Roberts, and many know, he's one of the pioneering uh, people in the 1986 position stand on exercising in the heat. When he went home, he became uh, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at Sydney, but he was also Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at McMaster University. He was also a very intense competitor, as many of you may know, and he was quite an athlete and certainly at extremes of, uh, of environmental conditions. But I'd like to say, and he truly was a friend, and, and I consider him to be a mentor, despite the fact that he didn't accept me to McMaster University for medical school, but this is, I think, a very uh, nice way to think about John and the fact that he was never meant to grow old. So what I hope to accomplish here in the next 35 to 40 minutes, as I said, this really is a talk that um, uh, I've thought a lot about, and it's actually taking my career a bit of a different direction, and I'll share some of those comments with you. For, uh, four areas that I want to address. The first is, are musculoskeletal problems really a big deal? And secondly, if we accept that they are, what are the challenges for us in sports medicine? Third, we'll digress perhaps a little bit because a lot of this is going to focus around injury and injury prevention and you know, what role does regenerative medicine play. And then finally, as I said, more specific to the, the theme of this lecture. So just to set the stage then, I realize I'm preaching to the choir here, but these are data that I actually find quite compelling. And these are, these are national data that are available online. And as you can see here, the, um, the um, significance, if you will, the prevalence of musculoskeletal disease based on some of these data at least is quite striking. And when you compare it to some of, of our other chronic conditions, I think you begin to see that musculoskeletal conditions are, are, are quite significant. Here's perhaps a different way of looking at the data. Uh, this again is available online. These are now uh, publicly available data. And what I'd like to draw your attention to here is the fact that uh, if you look at uh, the incidence and prevalence, but more importantly, if you look at the cost of musculoskeletal medicine, it's really quite telling. 
And so again, if you're dealing with budgets and so on and trying to make decisions, these things really do uh, come home to roost, if you will. Well, you might say, well, how is this, where are we going with regenerative medicine? Where, where's Tom going with this talk? So I wanted to kind of set the stage and perhaps look at a different, from a different perspective, if you will, and look at a different populations and some of the problems associated with musculoskeletal conditions. So if we look at the military, for example, here's a nice paper that was published in the Journal of Arthroplasty last year. It is admittedly a retrospective review, but it was the first one of its kind to really look at the military and start to quantify the incidence of not only incident, but secondary uh, osteoarthritis. And as you can see here, there's a, there's a lot of numbers on this slide, but I think the take home message here that you can see if you look at the, the graph at the bottom here, so on the y-axis you're looking at the uh, adjusted incidence rate, and then on the x-axis you're looking at time, and as you can see there's a positive slope there. So even for us non-engineers, you can see that this is a real problem, right? And more specifically, if you look at the risk factors, you can see that um, uh, age, race, and senior military rank were all associated with increased risk. This concept of age is going to hopefully come through in this lecture, and that is the fact that it had the most significant impact on the development of both primary and secondary osteoarthritis. But this isn't unique to the military, as you know, and Ted Brown and others at the University of Iowa published a study about 10 years ago, and they were the first to show us that patients presenting with post-traumatic arthritis were about 10.4 years younger than those who had primary knee osteoarthritis. So as Barry Franklin, I think, eloquently showed this morning, you know, we, we kind of go through cycles in medicine where we think we discover something new, and if we go back in the literature, we can see that a lot of this has been talked about before. So if you drill down again, looking at the military, you can see a study published in 2013 here where arthritis was the most common reason for failure of their examination board evaluation. And so it's a big problem in the military as well. Not to digress necessarily, but I think this is a topic that deserves attention and is really an opportunity for us in the sport medicine community. And that's to really address this question or try to answer the question, does physical activity cause osteoarthritis? I think when most of us in this room trained, we were, were sort of led to believe that if you had some osteoarthritis that you needed to shut it down. And I think that much like Barry showed us this morning looking at perhaps some of the data in the cardiovascular area, perhaps looking at the osteoarthritis literature, we should really start to question that. Well, you might say, okay, all right, this is great. So old people like us get osteoarthritis. What are we gonna do with stem cells? And we'll certainly try to address that here shortly. But what about, what about our adolescent population? What about our children and our grandchildren? Well, uh, the US Bone and Joint Initiative has started to put together some of these data. And again, these are available online publicly. Uh, I apologize, this is a bit of, of a, bit, a busy slide here, and this will be available after today's talk. But what I wanted to draw attention to here is that musculoskeletal conditions, and particularly joint pain, is actually something that's very common in the adolescent population. Perhaps I'm preaching to the choir again, but if you start to look at these numbers, it's actually quite striking. Well, if you take it one step further and you go beyond sort of musculoskeletal pain and you start to look at our particular interest in, say, sport medicine, what you can see here is a breakdown looking at different sports. And not too surprisingly, when you start to look at the contact sports, that's where we start to see the problems. What about overuse injuries? For a long time, we've been saying that this is a big problem in the adolescent population. We've been saying that without really having much data. But there's a couple of studies that are out there, and I think a couple that are about to be published here shortly that are drawing attention to the problems associated with overuse injuries as well. One I would draw your attention to here is Alison Schroeder was a medical student with me at, at, uh, at Ohio State, and she published this paper a couple years ago using Don Comstock's real system. Those of you who aren't familiar with that, Don's got a very nice uh, data capture system where she uses athletic trainers in her high schools, and she's able to document their exposure, if you will, so a practice or a game counts as an exposure, and then, of course, she's got the associated diagnosis. So Don's got a nice system, and I recognize there's others out there as well. Nevertheless, when Allison started to quantify it, and, and again, this is a busy slide, I realize, but what I'd like, like to draw your attention to here is a couple of points. First of all, you can see that girls seem to be at a greater risk for overuse injury than boys, and these are broken down by sport as well, and perhaps not too surprisingly, you see that girls' track and field is probably the highest if we're defining uh, overuse injury. I thought it was interesting that they were actually evenly distributed across the school years. This is something Allison had a particular interest in, as you can see here, that the percentage doesn't change across the year. Most common site, as you can see, is the lower leg, not too surprisingly. She looked at time loss from sport and so on. 
Well, you say, okay, so somebody gets an overuse injury, they're out for two or three weeks. Well, what about medical disqualification from sports, if you will, or as a result of sport in the adolescent population? And here's a paper that was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine last year. And as far as I'm aware, these are the first data available to, to look at this kind of a problem. And as you can see here, they broke it down for sport. And can, not too surprisingly, again, football is at the top at 26.5 per 1,000, uh, or I'm sorry, 100,000 athletic exposures. Interestingly, gymnastics and wrestling were, were not too far behind. And of course, it's the ACL that tends to be the one that uh, puts them on the shelf for a while. Well, you may say, okay, so you know, we have professional athletes, they, they tear their anterior cruciate ligament, and, and our surgical colleagues can fix the ligament. But as uh, Dr. Fowler taught me 30 years ago, or tried to impress upon me, he said, I can fix the ligament, he said, but I can't fix the joint. And that was always a question that stuck in my mind and is something that's motivating the, the final uh, stage of my career, if you will, at the University of Miami, is to really try to understand what's going on. So let's take a little bit closer look at our adolescent population. And we talked a little bit about this yesterday. These are some data that are recently uh, published uh, uh, out of the uh, Mayo Clinic by Mike Stewart. And this is looking at, probably not too surprising, but again, for the first time ever, quantifying the risk for osteoarthritis of the knee, particularly of the patellofemoral joint, following patellar dislocation. Again, things that, we, things that we think are intuitively obvious, but now we've got some real robust data to suggest that these young athletes in particular, and I'll show you in the next slide what the highest risk factors are, and this is something we need to be aware of. So to move us forward here, as I said, if you drill down in Mike's data a little bit closer, what he's done here is looked at the different risk factors, and not too surprisingly, it's the female, younger than age 18 at their initial dislocation, recurrent dislocation, as you can see, and then some radiographic evidence of either osteochondral injury or trochlear dysplasia. So now we have some data to suggest that even in the adolescent population, an injury at one point that we thought was not maybe that all significant may be much more significant than we ever thought, and again, may be an opportunity for us to consider for intervention. So this is probably the study that caught our attention, right? This was uh, published out of the Scandinavian literature back in 2004, 2005, and Roos and colleagues really for the first time uh, pointed out to us that something I think we all recognize, but they were able to quantify, and that is the risk for uh, osteoarthritis of the knee following uh, tear of the anterior cruciate ligament. And as you can see here, at least back in these original studies, they're suggesting that more than half of the individuals with a traumatic knee injury will develop osteoarthritis. And I think many of us in this room would argue that that may actually be much higher. So where am I going with this? Well, so we know that injury is a big risk factor for osteoarthritis, and we know there's some other factors as well, right? We know that BMI is a risk factor, we know that aging is a risk factor, and genetics as well. So when you look at those four factors, what are the ones that are modifiable? Well, you would say that injury is modifiable. Well, we're gonna talk about that in a couple of minutes as well, and obviously BMI as well. So, if you, again, go back to what I was taught 30 years ago by Dr. Fowler, that I can fix the ligament pretty well, but I can't fix the joint, and that's where we need to be thinking. I think this is a great example of a paper that was published a year ago by Christian Latterman from the University of Kentucky, as well as uh, Kurt Spindler, who's now at the Cleveland Clinic, as many of you probably know. And this was really, I thought, a nice study where uh, it was a, a multi-center study, and what they were attempting to do is to look at the early post-injury period. So after that initial ACL tear, if you will, and what's going on in that early post-injury period that maybe Dr. Fowler was right, that there's something going on I can't really address in terms of the joint. And as, in this particular study, as you may know, what they did is they randomized people to receiving a cortical steroid injection or a placebo, and they were looking at as one of their outcomes are some of the chondrogenic biomarkers um, uh, uh, for articular cartilage pathology. And the conclusion from this paper, as you can see in quotations here, is that post-traumatic osteoarthritis begins at the time of injury and results early on in dramatic matrix changes in the knee. However, it is encouraging that early intervention with an anti-inflammatory agent, i.e. a corticosteroid injection, was able to affect biomarkers of chondral degeneration. Well, um, Kurt isn't the only one, I think, to be thinking this way. And again, here's a couple of other examples. Uh, Robert Brophy from uh, Wash University uh, has taken a slightly different approach on this. And here's an example of some of his work. And this paper is actually five years old now, as you can see, published in uh, JBJS. 
And what they were interested in was, again, starting to look at some of these changes. And in this particular study, they were uh, looking at patients who uh, had suffered a meniscal tear and uh, with or without a concomitant ACL tear. And again, the thing that starts to arise here is that if you start looking at these patients a little bit closer, whether it's their synovial fluid or perhaps their plasma, what you'll see is that some of these markers are expressed ver early on. And of course, where I'm going with this to suggest is, is this an opportunity for us to start thinking about the orthobiologics and modulating that post-injury environment? So again, here's just another study that uh, Rob published recently and took it one step farther. They have a particular interest in the meniscus, and what he was able to show us here is that there's a difference between an acute tear and a degenerative tear in terms of the molecular expression of some of these cytokines and growth factors, which again is not too surprising, but I think the, the possibility exists, as I'm sure you would agree, is that these could become specific targets for intervention then. Well, as Sandy said, I had the, uh, you know, as they say, success is not the end, rather the journey. And so um, uh, last fall, I had the good fortune of uh, making a move to Coral Gables. Uh, I showed up on the 1st of October. A hurricane was supposed to hit on the 6th of October. So like every good Canadian, what do you do when there's a big storm, if there's a snowstorm? Dr. McIntyre? We stock up on Labatt's Blue, correct. So I went to the local bar in Coral Gables. I got a chance to meet some of my neighbors, and they quickly reassured me that we were just going to get a little bit of rain and everything was going to be fine. What I want to do in the next few minutes here is acknowledge uh, part of the reason that I'm up here, uh, and uh, it always reminds me of the African proverb when it says, if you want to go fast, you go alone, and if you want to go far, you go together. So the gentleman in the middle here, who's, uh, I believe, in the audience, Dr. Lee Kaplan, he's responsible for my recruitment to the University of Miami. We became very close friends 16 or 17 years ago when he finished his uh, fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh, and we were fortunate to work together at the University of Wisconsin for three or four years. I did have to teach him. He's, a, he's a, a Southern Florida resident, so I had to teach him the difference between a hockey stick and a football, but we were able to get things going. Uh, up on the left-hand side is Cliff Page, who many of you may know. Cliff is actually my second fellow at Ohio State, so we've been reunited. On the far right-hand side here is uh, Tony Griswold. He works in our uh, Genetics Institute and is largely responsible for some of the data that I want to share with you briefly. On the bottom right here is Diego Carrera, who's also in the audience. Uh, he's our quote-unquote stem cell guru, if you will. He was trained in Arnie Kaplan's lab up at Case Western. And uh, if you have an interest in articular cartilage and some of what's going on in that literature, I'd love to have you join us tomorrow morning for our two-hour session. And uh, Diego will share some of his thoughts on stem cells and, and what's really going on at the uh, cell level, if you will. And then finally is Charles Huang, who, like myself, is a biomedical engineer, but he's a real engineer. I always feel I'm a quasi-engineer when I'm associated with people like Charles. So I briefly want to share with you some of the data. As I said, this is, really does predate uh, me joining the, the team at the uh, University of Miami and is largely spearheaded by Dr. Kaplan and his interest both clinically as well as research on looking at articular cartilage. And is there some, some way we can intervene early on in this post-injury environment, if you will, to ultimately change their outcome, which as you know is probably osteoarthritis. And so we have a, a real robust effort, if you will, that's dedicated to looking at articular cartilage pathology and are there things that we can understand about that early injury period that can modulate uh, the healing response. In particular, we have an interest in looking at extracellular RNA, and as I mentioned earlier, Tony Griswold is really the, uh, the main uh, spearhead of this kind of work. And as you know, this is a real hot area right now, is trying to quantify the uh, microRNA expression of, of these different uh, factors that seem to be uh, it, uh, within the uh, milieu, if you will. And certainly, you have great examples in the cancer literature, the cardiovascular literature, the neurosciences literature. So we're kind of borrowing some of their techniques, if you will. and. Where we're trying to move with this again, and here's just another couple of examples of papers that Dr. Kaplan and colleagues have published in the last couple of years. Uh, the bottom one here in particular I think is quite interesting. What they were able to show is that if you uh, intervene with an IL-1 receptor antagonist, that you could actually reverse some of the changes that were going on after impact injury to articular cartilage. Our current study uh, that I'm helping to, to direct, if you will, has now enrolled over 90 patients. Uh, these are individuals who've had either an ACL tear, plus or minus a meniscus tear, and you can see some of the other inclusion exclusion criteria in here. And what we're doing is, uh, and again, this is largely responsible for Dr. Kaplan's work, is looking at that early uh, post-injury environment, getting a sample of their synovial fluid, and then actually taking this to the laboratory, 
and looking at their uh, microRNA expression here. So on the right-hand side, you can see a heat map. These data are somewhat preliminary, but we're very excited because a lot of our findings are matching what's in the literature now with Dr. Spindler and, and Dr. Brophy and others is to really understand what's going on again in that post-injury environment. Again, we're not the only ones who have an interest in this area. As you can see, here's a recent paper just published this year. In fact, this is looking at 29 patients undergoing knee and hip replacement for osteoarthritis. In this case, they were looking at total RNA uh, from articular cartilage uh, measured by qPCR. And as you can see here, one of their particular uh, agents, or one of the particular molecules they showed, microRNA-146A, is something I think Dr. Carrera is going to talk about tomorrow morning. He's got some very exciting data that, again, if you have an interest, I'd love to have you attend. Another study here, or another question we have as well, is to say, well, it's one thing to get synovial fluid. Uh, which is probably not the ideal way we'd like to go, obviously. And so others, as well as us, were starting to look at, is there a correlation between the changes we see in the synovial fluid and that of the, uh, of the plasma? And as you can see here, this study at least looking, if you look a little bit closer, it's probably at first glance looks very promising. But if you actually look at their data, there's, it's not quite as uh, hopeful as we had once thought. Here's another study that actually comes out of the University of Vermont with uh, Jimmy Slaughterbeck and Bruce Benyon and others where they had an interest in looking at was there a relationship between articular cartilage injury associated with ACL trauma and again the expression of some of these synovial fluid biomarkers. As well, they were interested to ask the question was there a relationship between the biomarkers and some of their patient outcomes such as the Coos score. And as you can see here, they've got data now looking at 39 patients. They're an average of about 70 days after injury with 32 controls. And what they did is they categorized these as low risk, looking at their ICRS score uh, of two of less, or high risk, meaning grade 3A, those were excluded. And as you can see here, they looked at markers of, col of collagen synthesis and metabolism. And what they were able to show is that there were no significant differences, at least when they looked at collagen synthesis and metabolism. However, they did notice an interesting association between the coos and synovial fluid collagen breakdown. Okay, so that's kind of the preface to say, this is sort of our approach at the University of Miami thinking about regenerative medicine and cell-based therapies and how do we want to sort of put together this conceptual model. So what we've come up with here is on the left-hand side, we've got our sort of preclinical in vitro in vivo work. And again, this is largely Dr. Carrera who spearheads this. In the middle, you can see clinical work, which is what Dr. Page and Dr. Kaplan are associated with. And then as the late Cy Frank said years ago, Tom, you can't take it from an N of one, you've got to take it to a population. Another way to look at this is to suggest that we could look at this as the pre-injury model, which would be primary prevention, moves us, shifts us to the injury model, and then of course to post-injury or secondary prevention. I mentioned earlier, one of the risk factors that we'd like to be able to control, of course, is ultimately injury. Well, Probably this gentleman on the far left-hand side here does not need an introduction. Um, this is Roald Barr, as I'm sure many of you know, and I had the good fortune of, of joining he and Lars uh, Engelbretson for the first time back in uh, 2004 when they had a particular interest in the hamstring injury, as I did at the time as well. And this is a really compelling, um, I, I, I would say, editorial that uh, Roald uh, published last year in the, in the uh, British Journal of Sports Medicine. And what I'd like to do is to quote his um, concluding statement here. And he says that to date, there is no screening test available to predict sports injuries with adequate test properties and no intervention study providing evidence in support of screening for injury risk. That's a pretty compelling statement, as you can imagine. And I think a lot of us have an interest in saying, boy, if we could really prevent these ACL tears, maybe we'd be able to make a valid contribution. But as another one of my mentors, Dr. Bill Garrett, told me, he said, I know how to prevent ACL tears. He said, I just stop girls from playing soccer. So <laughs> perhaps uh, Roald and Bill are on the same page. This is um, kind of something I've been thinking about for a while now, for the last few years. And that is to suggest, and, and this is certainly others, I think, are thinking the same way, is that maybe we need to really think about osteoarthritis in a different context. And recognizing, of course, that no two patients are the same. But one of the, I think, emerging thoughts here is that maybe there are different phenotypes of osteoarthritis. And so, for example, it can be an injury to the bone, it can be an injury to the cartilage, or to the synovium, or all three. And why do I suggest that? Well, maybe that presents opportunities then for us to think about our treatment modalities. Because the reality is, as you know, is we really don't have, at this point in time, a treatment that changes the, the uh, course of the disease. 
And more specific to that then is what is our, what's the current state of affairs? And obviously this would be a talk in and of itself, but if you think about most of our current treatments, whether it's acetaminophen, non anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, weight loss, and on and on and on, we're able to perhaps modulate or control patient's symptoms, but we're not changing the course of the disease. And that's where I think we're going in the future, and that's why today's talk is really based upon this premise that regenerative medicine may have something to offer us in terms of changing the course of the disease. The way I like to simplify this here, for me, it comes down to really two or three different ways to look at this. The first one is to specifically address the uh, issues around PRP, which I would term a growth factor uh, therapy. And then, of course, the second one is mesenchymal cell ther uh, therapies, which gets us more into the, the relevance of today's uh, discussion. Uh, PRP, I think if you asked me to give this talk two or three years ago, I would have uh, probably put a question mark behind saying PRP time has come, but I think it, in fact we've done a pretty nice job of showing that uh, PRP does work, and I'll perhaps offer some, some of my own personal thoughts on indications and perhaps contraindications. I think one of the things we're dealing with here in sport medicine, we always have and always will, and we'll address this more specifically when we get to stem cell therapies, is the fact that a lot of this is controlled by factors we wish uh, weren't uh, uh, true, so to speak. What that does is suggest to me is that as leaders in the field, we have to be much more uh, vocal and we need, to, we need to demonstrate leadership in terms of what's right and wrong and what we know and what we don't know. So again, I think PRP time has come. We can certainly think about this in terms of the orthobiologic therapies. And as you know, it's really just autologous blood with an increased platelet concentration obviously has advantages such as point of care delivery. We have, I think, a long ways to go, and I'm sure we'd all agree that, uh, I know when I first wrote a paper with Bruce Hamilton from uh, New Zealand on this, looking at PRP in uh, for the treatment of muscle injuries, at the time there were 12 or 13 different preparations out there, and the most recent one I can find is that there's currently 40 available, and what that tells us, of course, is we need you know, much more standardized techniques. I think we're starting to get some appreciation for the differences between an indications for leukocyte-rich and leukocyte-poor PRP preparations. We're now beginning to appreciate, of course, that it's dependent upon the concentration of platelets and some of these growth factors. And again, I think these are topics we've got to address in terms of understanding why is it that some patients respond to PRP and some don't. So, what I want to do now is, is really kind of call to question what's the evidence behind some of these treatments. And uh, these are slides, uh, thanks to Diego for, uh, he's much more sophisticated with computers than I am. I didn't even know how to get onto clinicaltrials.gov. And so Diego is responsible for the next couple of slides here. And what I want to draw to your attention is, you can see highlighted, uh, circled in red, is if you look at clinicaltrials.gov and you just type in PRP, you can see that there are 289 active studies. If we look at PRP, plasma, and orthopedics, you have 42 studies. So again, we've got some studies in PRP. Emerging indications, osteoarthritis, I probably should put a question mark there, although I think there's some recent data suggesting it could play a role. Uh, interesting paper published about two, uh, three years ago looking at partial tears of the, of the UCL of the elbow and showing that uh, these patients did quite well. ACL reconstruction, I'll, I'll leave that topic for others to address who are much more knowledgeable, but again, I think there's some suggestion it may work. Where the best evidence seems to be, as you know, is in the tendinopathy literature. And this is a nice uh, paper published last year. Uh, it was a meta-analysis of, a, a, a 18 study meta-analysis of over 1,000 patients. And as you can see, eight studies were judged to have low risk of bias, if you will, which is a good thing and it looked like the leukocyte-rich PRP preparations were better. Again, this is very specific to the tendinopathy literature now. And again, they do bring up, the authors bring up this important point that the preparations and injection techniques appear to be of great clinical significance. And again, I think these are areas that we really need to explore. Obviously, the advantages are that it appears like no major side effects, and of course, it's exempt from any FDA uh, necessary regulatory trials. It's more specific again to this area of PRP and perhaps this idea of tendinitis versus tendinosis. So again, if you go back to clinicaltrials.gov, and this is something I did a couple days ago in preparation for the literature, you can see that there's 16 trials underway. Six have actually been completed. What I wanted to draw your attention to is perhaps four of the uh, more significant or more well-designed studies, if you will. The first one by DeVos and colleagues from the Netherlands was published in JAMA, as you can see. And they looked at a combination of eccentric exercise with PRP versus a, a placebo with uh, eccentric exercise. And as you can see here, they didn't show any differences when they looked at pain scores and activity levels at these uh, various time intervals. 
A second one here published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. A one year follow up and as you can see, no difference again. So I mentioned earlier I think PRP is here to stay. Yet when you start to really drill down and look at uh, some of the more rigorous studies, perhaps level one studies, I think there's some question. A really interesting study which just hit the literature, I'm not sure if, how many of you have had a chance to look at this yet here, is the one that was just published online in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. It comes out of Denmark and it's looking at 60 males who had uh, eccentric exercise with either a high velocity saline injection, a PRP or placebo control. And again, you can see here, it was actually the saline injection group that did better than PRP. So as I said, I think PRP is here to stay. Obviously, many questions remain. And I think uh, a big one is, you know, what is the number of injections, if you will? We know that platelets have a lifespan in humans of about eight to 10 days. Uh, and as you can see here, there's a study back in 2015, which suggests there is, in fact, some dose response, if you will, and that two injections may be better than one. The question I always ask my colleagues who are doing these, particularly under ultrasound, is does the location of the injection matter? And I, I think it does. Uh, as an engineer, I think this is an area we really need to explore for any of these uh, cell-based therapies, and that is to suggest we've got to be able to standardize their post-injection loading patterns. Remember back to first year uh, of medical school, we know that biological tissues are incredibly sensitive to the loads that you place on them or don't place on them. So, in order to do these studies, I think with the highest level of rigor, we've got to have some sense of that, again, post-injection loading protocol, which is, again, partly responsible is uh, their, their physical therapy. Are the PRP effects due to the anti-inflammatory profile? I think this is a, a fair question to ask, and again, we'll address this with stem cell therapies as well. Interestingly now, people are starting to ask, should we, uh, should we combine PRP with stem cells? There's one paper that was, uh, or two papers at least, showing that uh, PRP is actually able to recruit stem cells from the circulation to the site of tendon injury. Now, whether that's the needle or the cells, we don't know. I think the role for o, uh, of PRP and OA remains unclear at this point. Again, what raises the question, and you can see here where there's one study recently published showing that uh, when you compare PRP with hyaluronic acid, PRP may in fact be better. Uh, so really where am I going with this? I, I love this. this. The goal of life is to die young and as late as possible. So. Um, for those of you who are, are over 65 and on Medicare like Bill Roberts, this is a great slide I think that you want to keep in mind. <laughs> so let's get to the heart of the matter and sort of how I'd like to, you know, to perhaps think about stem cell therapies here. And the way I look at this is what I would phrase the good, the bad, and the ugly. So what do we know so far? Well, from the basic science literature at least, basic science is very sound. The preclinical safety is very encouraging. The clinical data on safety in humans to this point appears to be encouraging as well. And here's a nice paper which is three years old suggesting that's the case. What's the bad? Well, we still lack high quality clinical data. And perhaps more importantly, the ugly. And that is the frequent use despite the above. And this is what I would refer to as stem cell tourism. And we'll address this more specifically in a couple of slides. So what is a stem cell? And again, I'd like to thank Diego for this slide. Um, I don't think we need to read the definition here in the interest of time. What I think is quite compelling here is to suggest if you look at the bottom and sort of what are the theoretical advantages? Well, cer certainly they can be mobilized during angiogenesis. As we know, they have the capacity to differentiate into the specific cell types that may be of interest to us in sport medicine. These cells can proliferate and regenerate. And perhaps it has something to do with their abilities to affect immunoregulation as well as growth factor expression. Some of the criteria, again, that are necessary, if you will, to, to actually categorize a cell as a stem cell, if you will. They have to be uh, positive, if you will, for certain cell, uh, surface antigen and markers. They have to be negative for neg uh, certain uh, hematopoietic markers. And these, again, are just reference points, if nothing else, for us to consider. So this is where I think it gets interesting. Because if we had a way to suggest that we could put cells in and we could somehow drive them down this uh, left-hand part of the slide here, we may have something. And again, I'd encourage you to, to attend tomorrow's uh, session on articular cartilage, where I think Dr. Carrera is going to share with you some exciting data coming out of his laboratory to, to suggest he's got an understanding, I think, or at least the early understanding as to what's really going on and what factors can we modulate. We don't know much about the right-hand side a part of the slide, as you know, and that's still something that's questioned. So again, let's make this more specific to sports medicine. Well, again, we know that uh, there's perhaps a limited uh, healing capacity of that torn ACL. 
What about that articular cartilage defect? What about the tendon rupture? And what about the meniscus tears? So we do, in fact, have several injuries that affect our athletes, affect our everyday patients, if you will, where maybe stem cells could play a role. The way I like to think about any of these new therapies, though, is the following. So what is the effect of the new treatment, i.e., what's its evidence for effectiveness? And that's what we'll speak about here briefly. Uh, what are the known and possible adverse events of this treatment, i.e., the safety profile? And I think we all recognize that there's been some case reports in the literature suggesting that stem cell therapies may, in fact, uh, not be the perfect panacea. And then I think an important question is more of a quality control, and that is, is the patient getting what is promised? This is a website I, I encourage you to take a look at, uh, which is uh, the, my uh, expression, if you will, for what's called stem cell tourism. And the problem in this country, as you know, is that we've got, at last count, there were over 600 centers doing this uh, kind of work, and much of this is, is not regulated. So we do have a problem on our hands. What about the FDA? So how does the FDA think about stem cell therapy? Well, first of all, the product has to have little manufacturing manipulation. So the processing of minimally manipulated cells must preserve the original relevant characteristics of the tissue. It must have autologous nature with no systemic effect, cannot be combined with other products, and finally has to be utilized in a homologous way or in the same way as its original function. And the point here is that from an FDA perspective, if the product does not comply, it's considered a new drug requiring traditional preclinical animal trials, clinical trials, and strong regulatory oversight. So more specifically then to, to the safety of stem cell therapies, as we know, field-derived stem cells, uh, they do pose a high risk of malignancy or a higher risk, if you will, than mesenchymal-derived stem cells. We're probably all aware that of the case report in the New England Journal last year, which is something I think we all think about, uh, who have an interest perhaps in, in the regenerative medicine area. This was uh, an example of something that none of us want to deal with, of course, and, and I think this is what's really sort of guiding our thinking along those lines. When you look in the orthopedic literature, at least, and musculoskeletal literature, there is some hope, I think, though, that in fact these therapies are safe, if you will. Here's an ex uh, example of a paper published back in 2012 where they looked at 36 controlled and uncontrolled studies and really couldn't show a difference in, in terms of risk for any kind of uh, problems, if you will. Back in 2013, there's a paper in osteoarthritis and cartilage which uh, suggests, again, that uh, intraarticular cell therapies with culture-expanded stem cells are actually safe. So what are the specific cell types? Well, we know that we've got adipose-derived cells. What's the potential advantage there? They're at higher number, obviously ease of harvest, and they may have better chondrogenic potential. There's some work out of Johnny Huard's lab in Houston suggesting that may be the case. The more traditional uh, approach, if you will, is perhaps bone marrow-derived cells, and it's the posterior superior iliac crest generally produces the highest yield. Interestingly, as I'm sure we know, that they're more concentrated and there's increased proliferative potential in younger patients. And I think one of the things that particularly motivates our interest in the osteoarthritis area, if you will, is that we know from some basic science work that if you look at these areas, for example, uh, if you look at an osteoarthritic joint or you look at a focal cartilage defect, there are fewer stem cells available and they seem to have reduced proliferative potential. So if you can add some of those cells back with an increased proliferative potential, we may have something. So I mentioned earlier uh, the, the website, if you will, which is clinicaltrials.gov. So when you start to drill down and you, and you look at stem cells, we start to see, I don't want to say a problem, but we see we don't have the same literature, the same rigor of literature, the same number of studies that we do looking at the tendinopathy um, uh, literature, if you will. So more specifically, looking at stem cells and osteoarthritis, as you can see here, this is kind of like a heat map. What you can see here is that in, in this country, 24 studies are going on. Uh, in my country of origin, there's one study going on, but then we count by twos for everything we do, so maybe we should change that to a two. But the point of this here is you can see that we just don't have as many studies that are, are currently registered looking at stem cells and osteoarthritis. I don't want to spend too much time here, but I'll just draw your attention to a few studies here. Um, obviously, again, I think it's still early in the game, but you have to start somewhere. And as you can see, a couple of studies, again, uh, CO back in 2015 looked at uh, 30 patients. These folks were all over 65 years of, uh, of age. Uh, they received adipose-derived stem cells and a quote-unquote second-look arthroscopy. They demonstrated improved clinical outcomes at, at uh, 24 months or two years. Interestingly, they also at second-look arthroscopy were judged to have uh, improved, if not maintained, cartilage status.
And again, I mentioned earlier, if you think about our current treatments for osteoarthritis, we're really treating clinical symptoms and not changing the course of the disease. And this may be where the holy grail is in terms of thinking about these uh, cell-based therapies. One of the questions I think is going to come up is going to be the so-called dose response, right? If I give X number of cells, I get a certain response. So if I give 2X number of cells, do I get a better response? Well, there's one study, it's a, it's a small study, but it is a study looking at 18 patients. And what they did here is they, they um, looked at, they divided them up into different uh, doses, if you will, of adipose-derived stem cell injections. And what you can see here is there may in fact be, and again, this is very preliminary, but there may be a dose response. This is a study that certainly caught my attention and, and maybe others in the audience as well. This was published again in a very reputable journal, Osteoarthritis and Cartilage, last year. It comes out of Korea from Kim and colleagues. And they looked at uh, 24 patients uh, with 24 knees. They had an isolated cartilage lesion with a KL grade 1 to 2 changes. And as you can see here, their inclusion for study for stem cell based therapies was that they had three months of non surgical treatment without improvement. That included physical therapy, but they could not have received corticosteroid or viscal supplementation injections. They underwent a single injection of adipose-derived stem cells from the buttocks, 120 cc's of implantation. Very important uh, point here, though, is they used a fibrin glue uh, scaffold. The outcome measures, as you can see, I think some pretty uh, uh, well-accepted uh, outcome measures, if you will. One is based on the MRI and using the so-called MOX grading system, which actually uh, quantifies the amount of articular cartilage that's present. And then I think some of the scores that we're all familiar with here in terms of patient-derived outcomes, if you will, looking at the IKDC and the Tegner activity level score. So to cut to the chase here, when you looked at their, uh, their results, I think they're very uh, encouraging, if you will. They looked at showing that, uh, at least with the MOX grading system, that tw uh, 21 of these lesions, uh, so 87.5% that were grade two or three before uh, surgery, so pretty advanced uh, changes, if you will, that they showed some very promise that uh, at follow-up, some of these actually looked quite, um, quite reassuring. They also showed that their Tegner and IKDC scores were, were improved as well. Study limitations, again, you know, typical sort of small size, if you will, but it's early in the game. Uh, they did not look at the relationship between their changes on uh, MRI and their clinical measures, if you will. They did not have a control group. And finally, uh, and I think this is a really important point, and that is to say, you know, do we need to put a scaffold in if we're using these cells? Because it may be a little bit, um, premature to think that we can just put these cells in and they're going to go to the place that we'd like them to go, if you will. So in the spirit of trying to be sort of, uh, I guess, objective about this and, and non-biased, if you will, here's a study that was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine last year. It comes out of the Netherlands. Uh, Paas and Hans Toll uh, published this study. It was a systematic review, at least their systematic review of the literature. And at the time, they had five randomized controlled trials. And, non, uh, and one non-randomized controlled trial were examined, as you can see. They had some very strict inclusion criteria in order to, to, to meet their uh, uh, review for the study, if you will. What they were particularly interested in was their bias in the studies that were published. And these, again, are RCT studies. What did they find? Well, again, they defined bias based upon the uh, Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Evidence Medicine, if you will, which is uh, published back in 2011. And you can see this is, a, I think, a fairly well accepted way of looking at different levels of bias within uh, studies. And the take home message here is, at least in the hands of uh, Hans and his colleagues, you can see here that all five of these RCTs, uh, they did support, or they did um, report superior efficacy for patient reported outcomes. And again, now we're getting out 24 to 48 months. You can see also radiological, histological, arthroscopic outcomes were, that were uh, favorable. They reported no serious effects, but in their hands at least, there was a high risk of bias with all six of these trials. Specifically, there was inadequate blinding and possible selection bias. Another study I think that's worth looking at was published in JB, uh, JBJS last year. And again, this was a different systematic review looking at uh, cell-based therapies for knee osteoarthritis and focal cartilage defect. You can see here they started with 420 titles that were screened, 34 papers that were reviewed, and six studies that were included. And those were four, uh, uh, four level two studies and two level three studies. <clears throat> 
the take home message here was that even though there was some promise, uh, what the authors found dif uh, difficult, if you will, to draw any definitive conclusions was the fact that five of the six studies that used uh, mesenchymal cell in, uh, uh, injections, if you will, they were also coupled with either PRP or hyaluronic acid. And only one of these cells actually, or one of these studies, I'm sorry, only uh, quantified the number of cells that were transplanted. So their conclusion was that effective clinical assessment and optimization of injection therapies is going to demand greater attention to study methodology, including blinding, standardized quantitative methods for cell harvesting, processing, characterization and delivery, and standardized reporting of outcomes. Here's another study. So again, if we're thinking about osteoarthritis, stem cells, would they have a role in, a, in the post meniscectomy patient, right? We understand the complications of that or the the side effects are, uh, of post uh procedures, if you will. And this was published again in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery back in 2014. It's a double-blind, randomized controlled trial where they did an intra-articular injection of stem cells par following a partial medial meniscectomy. This was a multi-institutional study, uh, 50 patients at the average age of 56. And what they did here, I think, I think this was a really nice study where they have got three groups of patients and they're actually also looking at dose response, if you will. In, in group A, they got uh, 50 times 10 to the 6 mesenchymal stem cells. Group B got 150 times 10 to the 6. So they also asked the question, does the dose matter? And as you can see, they followed their patients out to uh, 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 24 months. And interestingly, um, I think this is something that really deserves our attention. Uh, in their hands, at least, they uh, concluded that there was, quote unquote, increased meniscal volume for those in group A and B, and there was no changes noted in group C. Now, what's interesting, if you look at this closer, it's the group that got the lower number of stem cells that actually had the better outcome, at least in terms of their uh, radiologic assessment. They did show as well that uh, pain scores were improved uh, in the patients who received stem cells. Their conclusions, I think, are reasonable, but the limitations they're saying is that, and this is a big one, of course, is that the degree of OA was not controlled across groups. So they had fairly heterogeneous populations, and their intra and interrelator reliability for MRI readings was not reported. So this brings me to the final, perhaps, couple of slides and, and sort of where I think we're, we need to be thinking of going in this uh, opportunity. Uh, this is a slide I created actually when I was president back in 2010 and 11, so some of you have seen it before and I apologize, I don't mean to be repetitive, but it helps me to organize my thoughts around a topic like this, which, as I'm sure we're all aware, is probably, at least in my lifetime, has been the one that's gained the most attention in, in the sport medicine literature. And so it starts on the left-hand side, as you know, with some very well-controlled uh, studies that allow us to start to understand mechanism and we start to move there to ultimately, you know, can we help our patients? So the way I think about this is really the future is now, and what we need to do is we need to embrace this. As I mentioned yesterday in our talk, which was more specific to adolescents, uh, shame on us if we're not at the forefront of this and doing the right kinds of studies and educating our patients on, on what we know. So again, we need, clearly need standardized nomenclature to describe our cell populations. We need objective characterization. We need accurate reproducible description of our methods and the effects of cell processing. We need to quantitate and report the composition of these cells, as I mentioned uh, in my first uh, slide on this area. We need standardized patient reported outcomes, including pain and function. Imaging, I think, is going to be very critical, although it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to change the course of the disease. I think that may be the holy grail, but we'll see what happens. I think it's very important that we're honest with each other and we try as best as possible to enroll all patients who are receiving any of these kinds of therapies into central registries. And finally, we need to report our negative outcomes as well, right? And that's critical for any, any new disruptive technologies, if you will, in medicine that we need to report both the good and the, the negative, if you will. So I want to finish up with this final slide. You've heard several comments about John and the fact that he wouldn't uh, allow me into to medical school at McMaster University, but I've often thought about John as an agent of change, and I think what we're really looking at here with cell-based therapies is exactly that. We're on the frontier of something exciting. I don't think any of us really knows where this is going in the future, but I'll leave you with a couple of thoughts. And the first one is this was given to me by uh, Steve Gabby, who was our a CEO at Ohio State when I was there, and this is a... a comes from Machiavelli, so it, first point to think about. How about this? Back in 1943, the chairman of IBM, Thomas Watson, said, I think there's a world market for about five computers. And the, for those of you who aren't sorry, history buffs like I am or believe in computers, even though I don't know how to use one, 
Maybe you'll like music, and here's a quote from 1962. We don't like their sound. Groups of guitars are on their way out. So I'll conclude with those comments. And again, I, I appreciate your attention this afternoon, and it really was a very meaningful uh, opportunity for me. So uh, hopefully I've left you with something to think about and hope for the future that uh, we need to continue doing work in this area, and, and hopefully this will lead to better patient outcomes, which is ultimately what we're all here for. So thank you very much for your time and attention.